Of Myth and Mercy features adult topics and subject matter that some people may find disturbing. Listener discretion is advised. If you feel uncomfortable and need help, please contact your local crisis center. The North American Crisis Hotline numbers are listed in every episode description. Because of the way this society is organized, because of the violence that exists on the surface everywhere, you have to expect that there are going to be such explosions. You have to expect things like that as reactions. Hey, everybody. This is Alice from Of Myth and Mercy, and I'm here with my best friend and partner in reporting about crime, Cass. Say hello. Hello. Today, we're going to be covering the murder of Latasha Harlins, which is something that I had never heard about until recently, and Cass was kind enough to bring it to my attention. What are your thoughts on this, Cass? Well, I was like six or seven when the riots were going on in Los Angeles, and I only remember that it was about racism and that you know, Rodney King had been beaten up by cops and the cops had gotten away with it. And that was even very, like, vaguely known by me. But I actually didn't know about any of this stuff until I watched that O.J. Simpson, what was it, Made in America? Is that what it's mm-hmm. called? Yep, Made in America. Until I saw that documentary, which was made in 2016, not long ago. I didn't know that, you know... The Rodney King riots aren't really the Rodney King riots, they're the L.A. riots, and there was more than, you know, more than one cause. It was more than just the injustice of mm-hmm. this trial. Yeah, it was a, a whole thing, and actually, on uh, I had the privilege on Netflix of watching the really solid documentary called Let It Burn about the riots, which I, I highly recommend for someone growing up in the South in public school. I didn't learn anything about the riots, and I was, uh, it was never covered. They didn't teach it in Utah, either. There was actually a free documentary on it as well that that's pretty interesting it's not so much on it it goes over like the precursors and like what you know led up to the riots but there's actually a free one available it's on youtube and other streaming sites it's from the smithsonian and it's called the lost tapes the la riots it's about an hour or so long a lot of it is footage that is actually from like the era you know what i mean like that's journal like helicopter footage of the riots it's really interesting and you know it's i don't know i i'm really glad we got to cover this case Mm -hmm. i'm glad that you know it's that we can do it for black history month and remember someone who should really be remembered and who was almost lost to time more or less yeah if we can shine a light on her uh, with this episode i feel like we will have done something i don't want to say good for society because that sounds a little pretentious but i feel like her story deserves to be told we would have done something more for her legacy even though it seems Mm -hmm. like her family is kept alive Uh, but that said uh let's go ahead and jump in Cass, did you want to get started Los Angeles, as well as most of California, had experienced an extended period of growth in the 20th century. As the century wound up, California was experiencing a recession in its local economy. LA had gained a superficial national reputation for its progressiveness, its glamour, its glitz, but it also had gained infamy. For a long time, appearances of California seemed inclusive and less racist than other parts of the country. In part, this was due to Los Angeles electing their first black mayor in the 1980s. Tom Brady was respected and seen as a hero, and he also implemented a tremendous plan to improve and expand the subway system in that 80s as well. However, that plan is still ongoing today, and at one point in the 90s, it actually created a massive sinkhole in Hollywood Boulevard. The crowning jewel in Tom Brady's mayoral crown was the 1984 Olympics, which brought an economic rise initially to LA. The city received numerous tourist-focused upgrades for the games, and as they concluded, many hailed Mayor Brady for having kept the peace at the games, or at least appearances of it to the public. The truth is, Tom Brady had kept the calm by doing violent and infamous street gang sweeps that affected primarily black neighborhoods. The youth of these neighborhoods that had been targeted were being charged with draconian, antiquated laws in order to jail not only massive amounts of them, but keep them detained for lengthy periods of time. And while most never actually caught a charge formally, They were arrested and detained or jailed for weeks, if not months, mostly to keep them out of the way of the Olympics and the public eye. After the Olympics in the mid-80s, through the end of the decade, there was a spike in reports of police brutality, with rates at over 30% and over 1,400 officers investigated for use of excessive force over that time period. It was sad to say only 1% of those accused ended up prosecuted. The frustration over the lack of justice hung in the atmosphere of South Central LA like a fog. The economy after the Olympics had fluctuated and changed massively when it finally hit its normal stride again. 
The new normal was unstable and actually catalyzed a really bad economic decline. It was the deindustrialization of LA. It meant union jobs with fair wages and decent benefits, which were somewhat abundant in the area, were gone and replaced with mostly non-union service level jobs that paid minimum wage and didn't offer benefits or union protections. And as normal, when an economy suffers and jobs aren't paying bills, people found different vices and ways to escape the pain of their realities. The struggling found their desperation mounting and violence spread, crime increased, drug use went through the roof. More and more street gangs were born and grew and cracks grip on the impoverished, mostly African-American community strengthened. And that epidemic hit hard and devastated thousands of families. The end of the 80s revealed one of the largest gaps between richest and poorest income brackets in the entire United States. This meant the progressive appearance of LA was completely fake. It meant that LA was actually one of the most socioeconomically divided cities in the country. By the 1990s, American scholar Mike Davis, who was a historian, urban theorist, political activist, and writer in Southern California, said it best when he wrote, South Central LA has been betrayed by virtually every level of government. The LAPD had followed a paramilitaristic model since the 1950s when there was racially charged rioting throughout the valley. They unfairly targeted people of color, with racial profiling being common among LA's law enforcement community. There was also widespread institutional support of police brutality. There was a lot of anger from law enforcement officers towards the unemployed workforce and those who were limited to service jobs. Desperate times call for desperate measures. Those living in South Central LA saw cops as hostile and violent. They weren't there to protect them or help them anymore. Though it wasn't the only area of Southern California seeing reactions to the oppressive and harmful environment. In 1988, in Westwood, near the UCLA campus, rival gang members began a firefight in a crowded area. It was in this affluent neighborhood off of Broxton Avenue that a bystander would be struck by one of the gangs in the fray. A gunman from the Rolling Sixties had shot twice at his enemy, a Mansfield hustler crip twice. One shot missed and the other struck Karen Toshima. She was a graphic artist and an innocent bystander. She never even saw the LA Triggerman who took her life. This woke up many to the gang problem that was growing in South LA and its widespreading reach. The gunman who killed Miss Toshima was ultimately given life without parole after being convicted of first degree murder and first degree attempted murder during trial. But things were still getting hotter in LA. Latasha Harlins, known as Tasha to her friends and family, was born on July 14, 1975 in Chicago, Illinois, to her mother, Crystal Harlins, and an unknown father. Her birth certificate has the father listed as blank. Crystal was only 16 when she had Tasha, but she later started a relationship with Sylvester Vester Akoff. Crystal later had two children with him, Vester Jr. and Christina, both of which had his surname, not the Harlins like Tasha or Crystal. They moved at the age of six to join her extended family, which met Grandmother Ruth, her Aunt Denise, and her cousin Shanice, uh, who was also her best friend, and Uncle Richard, to South Central L.A. The family moved from East St. Louis in the hopes of better opportunities in California, especially in L.A. Unfortunately, the relationship between Crystal and Vester wasn't happy. Vester was emotionally and physically abusive towards her, fueled in part by heavy alcohol consumption. Crystal tried to make it work, but she eventually left him in 83. He stalked her even after they broke up, leading up to her petitioning for a restraining order in 84 due to him brutally beating her after a date with another man, of course, after they were broken up. Vester, like the stand-up guy he was, disregarded this completely and continued to stalk and beat Crystal uh, several times in the presence of their children and in Tasha's presence. The stress of dealing with an abusive, stalking ex and raising three children more or less on her own led to Crystal drinking more and going out more, as well as abusing cocaine. Vester continued to get in trouble with the law, racking up burglary and drug charges. All of this sort of led to a head. On September 30th, 1985, when Vester visited the family to celebrate his son's fifth birthday. Almost predictable family drama event. This led to him beating Crystal viciously while his new girlfriend, Cora, held Crystal down. Not really much of a happy birthday, especially since the entire family was there. On Thanksgiving Day, 1985, the 26-year-old Crystal was shot by Cora at a nightclub after hours, leaving her three children to be raised by their grandmother, Ruth. Cora was eventually sentenced to only five years in prison for this murder, and Tasha was only nine. The 1985 death of her mother devastated Latasha. 
and after that death, she felt responsible for the well-being and care of her brother and sister. She grew up quiet and reserved, and she was really private about her personal life, and she never discussed her family or the things at home with others. As she grew, Tasha took inspiration from the tragedies of her earlier life. She loved reading the newspaper. She was passionate about her community and found Harriet Tubman, Malcolm X, and Martin Luther King Jr. to be inspirational. She diligently read about them and other civil rights leaders. She loved history, politics, and current events, especially those that affected the black community. Ruth, Tasha's grandmother, had stepped up to take care of her grandchildren for most of their youth. Tasha and her siblings learned the importance of education, religion, and respect from the aging matriarch. Of course, Vester, stand-up guy that he was, he would occasionally visit, but he never offered monetary support and let alone offering much influence and, of course, didn't try to instill any guiding principles whenever he was around. Considering what we know about him, that was probably for the best. Tasha was also an honor roll student through her 6th and 7th grade years. She wanted to be an attorney when she grew up and she worked hard for it. This was inspired in part by her mother's death earlier. From the poetry that she authored in 1991, she wrote, quote, The most important thing to me is that my family is always protected by a shield, so they won't be harmed by dangerous, ruthless, uncaring people. If I had one wish, it would be to get my mother back to me. In another poem from February 91, Latasha describes herself as reliable, trustworthy, and honest. However, eventually, growing frustration and pent-up trauma began to spill over and out into the world. For years, Tasha felt unable to articulate her feelings adequately. Though she tried to release some of the inner turmoil through poetry, she still had trouble expressing herself. And even though the turmoil she was facing was affecting her more and more, she didn't have the emotional tools to know how to ask for help, even if she knew that she could. During a fight with her little sister, Tasha threw a fork at her, and the fork actually ended up hitting her younger sister in the eye and caused a permanent loss of eyesight. This stress, you could see, was definitely coming out. The guilt that Tasha had mixed with teenage angst and pubescent rebellion led to her talking back to her teachers and her family and becoming more of a behavioral challenge at school when she wasn't cutting class. Her grades dropped, and of course it didn't help that the bus was 13 miles away. She didn't have a car, and everyone who had a car in her family had to work. Just getting to and from school every day forced Tasha through two bus transfers and, of course, longer rides occasionally caused by that infamous L.A. traffic. So basically, she was on her own, even as a young teen. Despite acting out, she was still popular and had plenty of friends. Inspired by the movie Gremlins, they gave her the nickname Gizmo. Her friends described her as quiet and shy, but you knew better than to mess with her. They say that she wore blue dickies and a white t-shirt often with a black hoodie, quote, always the black hoodie, end quote. The Harlins had other issues involving Tasha causing tension at home. Rumor had gotten out that Tasha had been involved in two relationships with two fully grown adult men that were around her mother's age, as in 27 and 28. One was a neighborhood man known only as Ron, and the other was a guidance counselor at a local recreational center. Many women in the Harlins family had been teen mothers, and they compulsively restated the difficulties behind it and discouraged their kids from ending up in the situations that they had been in. These relations were even less acceptable because, again, the two men were nearly twice Tasha's age. This was not only pedophilic predatory behavior, it was statutory rape, and that's fucking gross. Not to mention Jerry Foster, the guidance counselor, he was taking advantage of his position of authority, especially one that he held authority over children. See, over time, Foster's actually exposed to having preyed upon and seduced numerous underage girls, a lot of preteens, and a lot of girls that were Latasha's age. Basically, he was using his position as a, a method for him to acquire and access these teenage women, which is just really fucking gross. Ruth actually argued with her the day before Natasha's death. She was pleading with Tasha to end the relationship, but in defiance, Tasha left the house and stayed with Jerry Foster against her family's best wishes that night. March 16, 1991 was the day that changed everyone's lives. Foster dropped Tasha off at Empire Liquor, which actually was an all-purpose store that sold more than just booze, that morning to get orange juice to bring home since it was just down the street from her house. Wearing her usual blue Dockers pants, her hat, sweatshirt, and uh, actually her cousin and best friend's Shanice's clock backpack, she just went in, normal morning, just to get some orange juice. Soon Ja Du was working behind the counter instead of the usual clerks, which were either her husband, who was resting in a van outside the store, or her son. 
Soon Ja Do, she was born in 1941 in Korea as the eldest daughter of a doctor and a nurse in, I apologize for mispronouncing this as I'm certain I will, in North Chungcheong province, and of course, Korea before it was split north and south. She married her husband, Billy Hyun Ki Do, shortly before her 18th birthday when she moved to Seoul. She immigrated to the U.S. in hopes of a better life, even though she was just a well-off housewife in Korea. She didn't have to work, everything was taken care of for her. Her husband dreamed of opening up multiple stores in the U.S., which he eventually did. However, all but the Empire Liquor Store were in more, I'd say, middle-class, less diverse areas. Coming from a more well-off social class in Korea, even having immigrated to the U.S., she sort of felt herself as more more elite social group, especially in comparison to the uh, neighborhood where she eventually was working that morning. Tasha, going back to the events of that day, she put the orange juice in her open backpack, the way teens often do, and turned to the counter to pay with $2 in hand, more than enough to pay for the orange juice. Du accused Tasha of attempting to steal the juice and grabbed her by the sweatshirt and yanked the backpack towards her. Tasha, reacting, I imagine is, I certainly would have, hit at Du and actually punched her and knocked her to the ground and then backed away. Just a few days before, a group of girls had beaten Tasha because she refused to join their gang. This probably added to her fight or flight response. Du, getting up from the ground, threw the stool she had been sitting on at the girl. Tasha bent down and picked up the orange juice that had fallen in the fight. She placed it on the counter and Du grabbed it from her and Tasha turned to leave. Reaching under the counter, Du picked up the handgun that was underneath a register and shot Tasha in the head from about three feet away, almost instantly killing the 15-year-old girl. When Du's husband, Billy, heard the shot, he rushed into the store. His wife fainted and he called 911 to report an attempted robbery. When the police arrived, they had to physically restrain Billy from slapping Soon Ja because he was just beating her as she was fainted on the ground. The trial of Soon Ja Du began in November 1991. The video footage of the incident from Latasha entering the store to Soon Ju's shooting was played in the courtroom for everyone to see. The film exposed the false claims Du had asserted that Latasha was the aggressor and attempted to rob her. Two witnesses also came forward for the trial, 9-year-old Asmali Ali and 13-year-old Lakeisha Combs, who were actually at the store buying Curl Activated for their mom. They saw the entire incident and also reinforced the video's perspective and debunked Dew's claims that attempted robbery was the reason she attacked Latasha, essentially. Soon Ja Du actually testified on her own behalf at the trial, the whole time still pushing the notion that she felt threatened by the teenage girl even though Latasha was walking away when Soon Ja Du shot. Evidence also revealed the gun Du had used was modified. The trigger of the firearm had been altered to be less resistant to compression when fired, which basically made it a sensitive hair trigger and made shooting the gun even easier. In the years prior to Latasha's shooting, there had been incidents with Korean shopkeepers shooting attempted robbers, but there was never any question that it was a robbery. Video and other evidence backed up the victims, or at least the suspects who ended up shot or killed, were the instigators of the fight or had malicious intentions when they entered the store. With this case, it was different. A month prior, two Korean immigrants were actually shot to death after complying with a robber the police had identified later as being a black man. Now, the incident that happened a month prior was also at a liquor store, but the incidents again contrasted from Soon Ja Du's accounts and her excuses for having shot Latasha. The trial was over on November 15th and the verdict was handed down by the jury. They found Du guilty of voluntary manslaughter with a maximum of a 16-year sentence. The jury basically said they believed Du was under full control and that her intent was to shoot Harlins with the pistol. And they also felt that she should receive the maximum sentence available and suggested this to the judge, Joyce Carlin. Judge Joyce Carlin, however, disregarded the jury's suggestion and stunned everyone following the case. Instead, she gave Du a ridiculously light sentence, five years probation, 400 hours community service, and a $500 fine. Which, if you think that's insulting, unbelievable, outrageous, inexcusable, you're absolutely right. In perspective, 1990, a year prior, of the 715 people who were convicted of voluntary manslaughter in the state of California, only six of them received probation. 
As a matter of fact, a sentence that was given to a man in Glendale who had kicked and stomped on a dog was more severe than what Dew had received for murdering Latasha. From a 1992 op-ed, there's a quote, You shoot a dog and you go to jail. You shoot a black kid and you get probation. Judge Carlin said to the court as she handed Dew this pathetic excuse for punishment, Did Mrs. Dew react inappropriately? Absolutely. But that reaction was understandable. I think it was. And then she added, This is not a time for revenge, and no matter what sentence this court imposes, Mrs. Dew will be punished every day for the rest of her life. It should go without saying that this sentence wasn't popular to anyone in either South Central LA or LA at large. District Attorney Ira Rayner publicly denounced the decision and said, quote, This was such a stunning miscarriage of justice that Judge Carlin cannot continue to hear criminal cases with any public credibility he asserted. He attempted to use an obscure California law to reassign cases that went to her, but it didn't work and was controversial as well, as some felt it would be counterproductive and some felt it would be judicial overreach. In conclusion, it was a mess. Judge Carlin was a target of protests in a recall campaign that was ultimately unsuccessful. Carlin wrote in a letter to the New York Times after they had endorsed one of her opponents in election, she wrote, quote, If judges have to look over their shoulders as they decide a case, if they have to test the political winds in order to arrive at a politically correct verdict, then the judicial system and the freedoms it guarantees will be destroyed. I know this is a podcast and you can't see what my face is, but just imagine a disgusted look and that's what it is. I I think that it's, you know, it's just just miscarriage of justice. Mm -hmm. Sorry, just go ahead. It's okay. It's good. It's, don't be, it's okay. I feel the same. My personal favorite about that statement is how she says that it's politically correct, that there should be actual justice rather than you know literally Yikes. like I don't there's a reason why people make fun of white people for caring more about animals than people of color there's a reason for that and of course because life is wonderful Judge Carlin was re-elected to the Superior Court bench and then moved to the Juvenile Dependency Court a transfer that she had requested since before the due case no repercussions at all I mentioned earlier there's a mysterious metaphorical thing The blast from racial tensions, the lack of justice, marginalization, the stress, and the oppression was imminent. While sometimes referred to as the Rodney King riots, both Latasha Harlan and other structural problems African Americans in the area were facing were major precursors to them. And calling it the Rodney King riots not only erases Latasha, but also those who lost their freedom, lives, and family due to the years leading up to the uprising. The shooting of Harlan's actually occurred two weeks after King's beating took place, but due to the court system, Harlan's trial was actually completed first. While people were still reeling from the atrocity that was the verdict of Harlan's trial, the three-month trial of King's wound down. Again, despite video of the incident, a jury of mostly white people acquitted the four LAPD members who beat King of all charges. This was the last straw. It was too much and too many for the community. The lack of accountability for police brutality and overreach, the cold-blooded murder of a 15-year-old innocent girl without any justice or closure, it was just too much. Immediately after the King verdict, South Central Los Angeles erupted into chaos. For four days, riots consumed and leveled neighborhoods and businesses. No justice, no peace became the anthem of the insurrections, and it was a revisit to the chants from protesters almost a full year prior at Empire Liquor Market right after Latasha was killed. The chaos was sort of televised, at least as best as it could be, with violence threatening away most journalists and media. Protesters chanted not only no justice, no peace, but the names of King and Harlan's. Photos and footage of the area during and after the riots show their names spray painted on buildings next to each other all over South Central. As a matter of fact, Empire Liquors where Latasha was shot was looted and burned to the ground during the rioting and it never was reopened. Korean communities such as their businesses and clubs and liquor and convenience stores were targeted with extra aggression during the riots. Over a billion dollars estimated property damage was taken by the Korean immigrant community, you know, of the damage done during the riots. Almost half of the damage from the riots had been sustained uh, just by Korean owned businesses and things just Honestly, probably because uh, there was just so much tension between the Korean community and the black community at the time, of course, seen with uh, the trial of Soon Ja Do. More than 10,000 shopkeepers 
all Korean immigrants and their families were affected. 2,300 predominantly Korean-owned businesses were casualties of the rioting, and most never returned due both to politics and inability to rebuild or recoup their losses. The riots were extremely traumatic to the LA Korean-American community. To this day, the riots refer to as Saigu, which translates to April 29th in Korean. It's only been within the last 10 years that the relations between the Korean and black community in LA has improved. Though there's still a lot of tension, uh, just with all the history that's gone on. The importance of minorities uniting to fight racism together has helped bring calm as time goes on, and although there is always going to be a memory of injustice and lives lost that can't be really brought back. Something of note, in 2012, more than two decades after, Rodney King stated to CNN that he had forgiven the officers who brutalized him. Tragedy followed quickly after when he was found dead just a few months later in a swimming pool in Rialto, California. He was only 47 years old. Since her trial, Latasha Harlan's family has been a non-stop force of advocacy and activism all done in her name. Her legend lives on through their tireless work nationwide. Her aunt Denise Harlan's actually told the Los Angeles Times in 1993 that immediately after she heard the verdict at Latasha's trial, she, she said, quote, It was like a knife going through my heart. That's when it all went to my head to do something, though I didn't know what. Author Brenda Stevenson, who wrote the book The Contested Murder of Latasha Harlan's, which is an excellent book that I can't recommend enough, she said, quote, What happened is that five or ten years later, the media fell back into thinking about the LA rebellion in a way that we typically think about all racial conflict, which is that it's a male event. Rodney King is kind of the perfect victim of white male police brutality. We don't think about females who are involved. It's the same reason why we don't pay so much attention to all the women who've been killed in the last few years by the police, like Miriam Carey or Kendra James. But everyone knows the names of Michael Brown and Trayvon Martin and Tamir Rice and Philando Castile. Our imagination is dominated by male images of what happens to men and what men are doing. For example, in the case of Latasha Harlan's, the judge is not male, she is female. The person who killed Latasha is not male, she is a woman. The district attorney in that case is a woman." End quote. All of this is still going on. Black girls are still profiled and treated as less than human in stores, regardless of the owner's ethnicity. Uh, for example, in Charlotte, North Carolina, in a uh, Misa beauty store, which is a Korean uh, beauty brand, a, a black girl was attacked by the shopkeeper, who just assumed that she was shoplifting. She wasn't, but that violence still happens today. And the issues that led to the 92 riots are still around, and they're still festering. Right, and the LA riots, they were a major event in recent U.S. history. Uh, I guess depending on what you consider recent. I consider recent. It's happened in my lifetime. But the riots themselves as a concept, they're more than just a haunting of like a past generation. What's happened is obviously parts of it have not only been trivialized or skewed, but almost completely erased. I mean, Latasha Harlan's erasure from her, you know, how she played a part essentially in the final kind of start of the riots, it, it was it was almost gone abruptly after her trial. Right after it had concluded, right after the riots, there's a notable decline in how often she's mentioned in articles referencing the riots. Before long, it's almost as if she didn't exist at all. Actually, after her trial, about four years later, there was a vigil held in honor of Latasha and less than 10 people showed up to it. And this is such a huge contrast to, you know, just four years prior when people were spray painting her name on buildings next to Rodney King's. It took four years for her to almost disappear in this community after so much loss and pain had been caused by her, you know, the injustice that that happened to her in her name. And even like I said, I didn't know she even existed or, or like the whole incident behind her until I saw that O.J. Simpson Made in America documentary. That was within the last two years. And it's like part of me almost thinks that I guess one of my theories was, oh, well, after the riots, people just don't want to think about that violent episode and just move forward. But that's not the case. Everyone still knows about Rodney King. I mean, he's entered the, I won't say famous, or infamous, you know, tally of uh, American police brutality cases. But what about Latasha? Sure, it wasn't police brutality, but that was an injustice. That was a grave, I, I call this carriage of justice. It was definitely a, a, an anti-Black mm -hmm. position, which is why the Say Her Name movement has helped bring her back from 
pretty much oblivion in, you know, history. Mm -hmm. The Say Her Name movement, they focus on not just police brutality, but on on uh, women who have died due to anti-blackness. And this is definitely this is definitely a, a solid case of it. Latasha is, you know, 25 years later, everybody finally remembered to say her name when for years she just slowly dropped from sight. Uh, her family has been super active. I mean, they are still constantly, you know, attending Black Lives Matter, you know, rallies. They go to, you know, uh, they, they do speaking events. Uh, they do work for charity. They are doing so much in her name. And it's amazing that it's amazing that they're able to do that because really like that's something I think Latasha would have wanted. The fact she wanted to be a lawyer, the fact she idolized like Malcolm X and these really amazing empowered leaders. I guarantee if she was around now, she'd be doing that. Yeah, it's just, I mean, we see this all the time, especially with women of color, where when something bad happens, it's in history, it's easy to say, oh, this bad thing happened. So it's creating angst for the quote protagonist of the story for the for the male protagonist. It's just when bad things happen to women, it's because they are we're adding pathos to someone else's story like, oh, well, it's not just that, though. It's the race thing. Oh, the yeah, race oh, is, yeah. is absolutely be inextricably linked. And whether, you know, the one thing that we need to be careful of, and this is something like Kimberly Crenshaw talks a lot about in her writings, when racism and sexism is so intersectional, we can't separate the two and you just can't, you can't divide the two at the same time. You know what I mean? Like it's, there's like a certain level where it stops being your lane because it does start being racially charged. Like I'm trying to be really careful with this case because I do not want to, you know, pit Eric Garner against Latasha Harlins because he's a man so he gets attention. Oh, not at all. That's not something like we have in our lane to talk oh, yeah. about. Like we should not be dividing those two. You know, I just, I just want to stress that typically like women are fridge. It's not like a oppression Olympics here. There are no winners. There's only shitty things that have happened. I also wanted to pull a, a comparison with Latasha's black hoodie and Trayvon Martin in his hoodie. It's almost like we're reliving history all over again. And, and we really are. But it, it's not that we're reliving it. I don't think it ever went away. And I think most people will agree with me there. Yeah, it never went away. It's just the issues. That's why the issues that led to the 92 riots, they're still around. Nothing has changed. We highly encourage everyone to check out the Blood on the Rocks podcast. We listen to them regularly here. Here's their promo, and again, we encourage you all to check them out. Hello, and welcome to a promo for Blood on the Rocks, a podcast on all things creepy, morbid, or otherwise dark. I'm your host, Axel Taylor. Join me and various guest hosts as we cover a whole load of subjects. We'll show you the world of serial killers, accidents, hauntings, black metal, and more. Find us on iTunes, Stitcher, and all those other fancy podcast platforms. Our core and funny content may vary. With this incomplete list, we do have some names that we would like to say in honor of the Say Her Name movement before we conclude this episode. Sandra Bland. Corin Gaines. Alexia Christian. Rakia Boyd. Eleanor Bumpers. Charlena Siobhan. Danette Daniels. Melissa Williams. Miriam Carey. Tanisha Anderson. And there's so many more that we don't even have the time to cover. Always remember these women. They deserve to be in our memory forever. Natasha Harlins. Remember that name. Because a bottle of juice is not something to die for. Bye, guys. We'll see you in two weeks. Have a good one. Be safe. Don't murder. Don't murder, guys. Bye. I mean, that's why when someone asked me about violence, I just uh, I just found it incredible. It, because it, what it means is that the person who's asking that question has absolutely no idea what black people have gone through, what black people have experienced in this country since the time the first black person was kidnapped from the shores of Africa. Thank you for listening. A Myth and Mercy is available on Stitcher, Google Play, and iTunes. Check us out on mythandmercy.com, Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, and Patreon. Post-production wizardry and music composition by the maniacal genius Aaron Henry.